David Aronovich hosts a special edition of Archive on 4 to explore the power of political forgetting. Welcome to the Council Chamber at Old Broadcasting House in central London. This Art Deco stone building opened in 1932, which is now at the very edge of living memory, which makes this an appropriately amnesiac place for tonight's edition of Archive on 4. Eventually, any event or crisis, the Depression, say, or the war, slips from the population's first-hand memories. However big a deal, however huge its impact, as the generation who experienced it dies and new generations born later reach adulthood, a kind of national political forgetting takes place. Some events live on in second-hand memory, in tales told by parents, in history books, in the kind of archive recordings we'll hear this evening. But the feeling of being right there, right then, is gone. In 2009, 20 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall in her native Germany, this is how the Labour MP Gisela Stewart remembered the impact of that moment. The police uh, commander on duty here at Checkpoint Charlie has suddenly announced that they can go over, even though they may not have the right documents. Standing mesmerised in front of the television set, because I just couldn't believe it. I mean, this is the day where the world is gone. He sees she's crying. A few weeks later, Lena Bernstein then conducted a special performance in Berlin where an international group of musicians played Beethoven's Ninth, which is the Ode to Joy, which in German is Freude schöner Götterfunke. And instead of Ode to Joy, they made it the Ode to Freedom. And it became known as the Freedom Concert, the Freiheit Concert. And I just stood in the, in the front room watching this on television, tears streaming down my face. And my children, they just couldn't understand what was going on because all they could see was a, a television broadcast of a concert and their mother standing there uncontrollably crying. Today, you have to be at least 33 to have any direct recollection of the wall coming down, let alone how things were before. But does this matter? In this programme, I want to explore the impact this process of forgetting might have on what is politically possible. Can such forgetting make something that had long been unthinkable into something that is thinkable once more? During this summer's Labour leadership race, the papers have been full of those who remember the 1980s warning those who don't that they shouldn't repeat the party's turmoil of 30 years ago. To them, the idea of a leader more left-wing than Michael Foote has been unthinkable for 30 years. But it appears that for many new Labour members or affiliates, it is perfectly thinkable. We'll see in the next few days how many of them have thought it. To explore all this, I'm joined by three people with a mix of historical perspective and personal memory, which will, I hope, help us make sense of the power of political forgetting, for good and ill alike. Juliet Gardner is a historian and author of The Thirties and The Blitz. Danny Finkelstein is a journalist and also a Conservative member of the House of Lords. And Andy Beckett is a journalist and author of When the Lights Went Out on Britain in the 1970s and now Promised You a Miracle on 1980 to 1982. Here in the council chamber, we have three groups, each with a different span of political memories. We have some people in their 20s, some in their 50s, and some in their 80s. Karine Bambara, you're 28. What's your earliest political memory? My first political memory is coming home from a shopping with a friend one day and seeing 9-11 unfold. Um, with our mouths wide open, we just stared at the television and then later on went to discuss the political implications with friends and family. Here's some archive from that day. The pictures that you're seeing now are live pictures of the World Trade Center in New York, which has been hit by two separate passenger planes. Alan Radford, I think you're a, a little bit older. I was about 11 years of age, I think, when I heard this man, Winston Churchill, speaking on the radio and loads and loads of applause. Yet this was the same man who I'd seen in the cinema where the audience had stood up and booed because of his atrocities in Wales that he committed. Well, we haven't got a clip of Churchill being booed by a cinema audience, but here he is being booed in person. 
very good name for them. The Booing Party. Have another one. Have another good does this idea of political forgetting actually make any sense to you? Uh, Danny, when you talk to your children, for instance? Yes. <clears throat> so I was talking to my son about homosexuality and the legalisation of gay marriage. And I realised that he completely didn't understand all the struggle that had gone on about gay rights. Throughout my teens, it's one of the big civil rights issues of my lifetime. And it had passed him by completely because by the time he'd arrived at political consciousness, he's now 15, the battle had been won. And so he felt that it was just a... That it he was felt that it was very strange. And we had quite a lot of conversation about the question of, of outing people and people coming out. And because the idea that uh, being in the closet and gay, having a sense of shame attached to it, which for a long, long time, shamefully it did, was alien to him, he simply couldn't understand even why the debate was taking place. Julie, I suppose we should bear in mind that memory is not a neutral process, is it? No. So a lot of memories are actually instrumentalised, they're made use of. Why do we remember VE Day so clearly? And that's partly, of course, because that was, you know, when Britain seemed to be absolutely triumphant, you know, we'd held together, we'd bank, we were, we'd beaten, you know, the enemy. And it's no accident, it seems to me, that that's replayed again and again. The other memories we don't play quite so often if we think about certain defeats. Andy, our political leaders obviously have a disproportionate effect, in a sense, on what we do or where the country goes. Do you think their early personal memories and experiences are a very significant or any very significant guide to what they feel and what they want to do? Yes, I would argue that a lot of New Labour's politicians were absolutely scarred as youngsters by Labour losing in 92 particularly, and perhaps by Labour losing in 83 and 87. And that gave them an innate caution and a kind of pessimism about what the left could achieve in Britain because of those elections and staying up and watching Labour lose. And I'm sure the election we've just had will have the same effect on another generation of Labour politicians who will be cautious in 15 years' time when they're running the country. OK, so... Let's explore now the power of political forgetting by examining a particular case study in some detail. In 1971, when I was 17 and at school, I remember my economics teacher telling us in the class that the British people would never accept one million people unemployed. At that point, the depression of the 1930s was well within living memory for anyone over 50, and that included most senior politicians. But then, on 20th of January 1972, the number of people without work actually did reach a million. I'd hoped I would never see unemployment reach this level. And our measures are taking longer to have effect than I'd hoped they would. But why was the Conservative Employment Secretary, Robert Carr, so audibly worried? Conservative MP David Davis recalls a telling anecdote told by Jim Pryor, one of Carr's Cabinet colleagues. What Jim told me was that Robert's whole attitude had been defined when he was a schoolboy at Westminster School, a great public school that sits on the other side of Parliament Square from Parliament. And he had been driven into school one day in his father's car by his father's chauffeur, only to see converging large numbers of hunger marchers uh, going to, to Westminster to protest. And this stuck with him for all of his life, this, this image of bedraggled, clearly poor, poverty-stricken, hungry men mostly, turning up at Parliament to protest their unemployment, the fact they couldn't get work and that they were, their families were hungry as a result. And I don't think that ever left him. You were seeing the face of hunger in your own streets. In 1971, the BBC made a documentary about the 1936 march from Tyneside to Parliament by unemployed Jarrow shipbuilders. It had no need of historians. Every speaker was a witness. But week by week you could see them, oh, getting a little more morose, trying to keep cheerful. But there was the shattering human indignity of working men at those times. These were the men who had built the ships that could won the war. These were the, the mass unemployment of the 1930s marked two generations of politicians. From Harold Macmillan, Prime Minister in the early 60s, who'd been an MP in the north-east of England during the Depression... ...would be men walking up and down vaguely through the area, looking for a job that everybody knew wasn't there. To Edward Heath, Conservative Prime Minister in the early 70s. Of course, my generation was very much influenced by what had happened between the wars in the political views which we developed. Uh, 
All through the 30s, we had mass unemployment. I certainly saw uh, the restrictions imposed on people by poverty. Uh, Another affected was the head of the civil service, an ex-grammar school boy, uh, Sir William Armstrong. Uh, to help in whatever way I could to avoid the mass unemployment of the early 30s. To deal with those prices... For two years after taking control, office in 1970, the Heath the government had adopted a broadly laissez-faire, less interventionist approach. But after unemployment had hit a million, the Prime Minister, with Armstrong at his side, did a sharp U-turn. A situation in which unemployment has fallen by 150,000 seasonally adjusted... The government had decided, as my economics teacher had predicted, that a million unemployed was too much for Britain to bear. But if unemployment was one kind of nightmare, there was another looming. And as we prepare to go to the polls, we hear from all sides the prophets of doom. By 1974, politicians of both big parties saw another rising danger. Inflation. Chancellor Dennis Healy said in his first budget speech that the political and social strains resulting from inflation may be too violent for the fabric of our democratic institutions to withstand. This was a different spectre from the 1930s, a high inflation that had helped drive despairing Germans into the arms of the Nazis. Even so, allowing mass unemployment seemed unthinkable. While we could think of nothing to do with our three million unemployed, Adolf Hitler could think of plenty to do with Germany's six million. She remembers the 30s and how bad it was. In my case it was, at any rate. My husband was in the building trade, and of course that was very badly hit in the 1930s, you see. Britain's standard of living is already lower than all the other common market countries. You just have to sell a piece of furniture or something like that, you know, if you're really desperate. I think you will find that your society is a great deal less stable than you believe. When I think about it, it makes me see red. And indeed that there may be tensions, possibly revolutionary tensions in the long run. I feel more sorry for the young people than I do for myself. They don't realise, they don't know what the 1930s meant. At this moment... The bogeyman of joblessness was more potent than the bogeyman of inflation. When Heath and Carr were defeated, Labour's incoming leaders like James Callaghan, Michael Foote and Harold Wilson were still haunted by the mass unemployment of the 30s. His father was unemployed and they couldn't afford to keep him at school. There were many of my school colleagues who didn't get jobs. Millions of them unemployed were left to root for themselves without a chance. For the best part of a decade, the only way to protect jobs and hold down prices seemed to be a deal with the unions. But one visionary, Keith Joseph, born in 1918, was beginning to rebel against the use of the 30s as a political taboo. Socialist exaggeration of unemployment levels, together with marches on Parliament, play-acting the 1930s, has stampeded us into rash overexpansion with resultant price increases and economic dislocation, we must not be stampeded again. In the late 70s, Prime Minister James Callaghan wanted to resolve Britain's economic difficulties, but... Not by the whip or scourge or lash of unemployment, but was restoring Britain by trying to keep a measure of agreement. It worked to some extent, but unemployment remained too high. Gloomy news today for people looking for jobs in East Kent. With unemployment rising, the number of vacancies has dropped to only about half the figure available. The pound plummeted to its lowest level against most foreign currencies. There's a forecast that three million people will be unemployed by 19... Another sharp rise in unemployment. Gravediggers in Southwark have joined the borough-wide strike by their fellow transport and general workers, the dustmen. And this, according to local undertakers, is creating new problems. Finally, Labour's deals with the unions broke down in the winter of discontent. By the 1979 election, unemployment was double what it was when Wilson and Callaghan took office. And the Conservatives' election broadcasts attacked Labour on the familiar grounds that this level of unemployment was unacceptable. So we have less work, which means a dole queue that would stretch from London to Edinburgh. Andy Beckett, can we draw a direct line between the policies of the politicians and both major parties at that time and their memories of the 30s? I think we absolutely can because Heath's family had had a pretty tough time during the Depression. His dad was a carpenter and then a, 
an owner of a small business employing other carpenters and had a tough time. Wilson's dad had actually been unemployed for quite long periods, so I think they were both directly affected. And unemployment between the 40s and the 70s remained low, so we'd had a long period of unemployment not being a big issue. So when it began to return, it seemed quite logical to people that this was back to the spectre of the 30s. Does that sound right to you, Juliet, that after a time when unemployment had ceased to be a factor, people reached back into their memories for the last time when it had been like this and found themselves back in those days? Yes, I think it was, and I think it was also a political criticism in a sense, because one of the points about the 30s was the despair that people felt that the government didn't seem to be able to do anything about it. You know, they didn't seem to be taking action, all they seemed to be doing was being punitive. And I think things like the means test and things like that still resonated with a lot of people, or certainly their parents. So, in 1979, Jim Callaghan, born in 1912, was replaced as Prime Minister by Margaret Thatcher, born in 1925. And unlike Callaghan, she was prepared to see unemployment rise as, in her view, a temporary, unavoidable consequence of the changes she thought the economy needed. In her autobiography, Thatcher does recall seeing dole queues in the Lincolnshire town where she grew up, but Grantham was only mildly hit And in 1933, at the height of the Depression, she was only eight. She was clearly not as marked by it as politicians born a decade earlier. A 2008 documentary based on newly discovered letters to her sister Muriel shows how she did encounter the sharp end of the Depression, but only at a slight distance. We're not going to let a ruddy policeman stop us! Ah. Earlier in the week, Tuesday to be precise, I went to see Love on the Dole with Mummy. But I can't say that I enjoyed it although it was a good film. The 30s was a period of rising unemployment, of a worldwide depression. We had cousins in America who lost everything in the depression in America. Tomorrow, May Day, up to 500 marchers will begin a month-long trek across England, organised by the trade union movement... But by 1981, with unemployment in some areas of Liverpool, for example, hitting 40%, there were attempts to invoke the 1930s as a way to pressure Mrs Thatcher's government to change course. I believed, when I was about 19 years of age, that I should be getting something better out of life. Trade unionist Frank Deegan had been an unemployed docker and hunger marcher in the 1930s, and in April 1981 he helped to organise a pointed reprise of those protests, the People's March for Jobs. Many of us were uh, poverty-stricken. Helping to raise the banner of the working class on the People's March of 1981 may be a nostalgic reenactment of the 1920s and 30s, but the meaning is the same. The blazing beacon that lit the night sky above Moss Side Street was a... is going on again in several cities. The police have now sealed off of the rioters first major rampage. And when urban riots broke out in the summer of 1981, some contended this was the direct consequence of high unemployment. That September, Michael Foote, now leader of the Labour Party, joined the chorus invoking the 1930s. It was mass unemployment on that kind of scale which produced Hitlerism and all its horrors. The same month, Norman Tebbit was appointed Employment Secretary as part of Mrs Thatcher's promotion of younger, like-minded ministers. Tebbit was born in 1931 in North London, his father an assistant shop manager until he lost his job. Now Tebbit countered the idea that mass unemployment necessitated violent strife, with a memory of his own. I know those problems. I grew up in the 30s with an unemployed father. He didn't riot. He got on his bike and looked for work, and he kept looking till he found it. A lot of bikes would have been needed, because three months later came this. For the first time in Britain, more than three million people are officially without the work. The fact that this grim new record was expected doesn't ease the pain or diminish the anger. That autumn, a BBC TV series began which followed the struggles of five jobless Liverpool men and which captured in two words, giz a job, the despair of the unemployed. Alan Bleasdale's The Boys from the Black Stuff. Talk to me about hardship and want. 
Talk to me about no shoes on your feet. Have you any idea what no shoes on your feet means? You get your feet? In the last episode, ageing socialist Mary Malone invokes her generation's memory of the hunger marches to castigate her trade unionist sons for giving up on the struggle, much to their frustration. Right, things are theatres and soup kitchens and hunger marches. You with your father marching from the northeast, and me dad with his, and standing together and fighting. And it means another time and age, man. And the only reason things got better was because of men like you, a father. If we allow mass unemployment to take its grip in Europe, United States, and elsewhere, who can say that that mass unemployment is not going to have the same kind of consequences it had? In the 1930s. In the general election campaign in June 1983, Foote, now 70, was still raising a familiar ghost. But he was out of time. No government anywhere has shown more vigour and imagination in its efforts to help the unemployed than this one. Six days after those speeches, voters elected the smallest number of Labour MPs since 1935. Mrs Thatcher is having a working lunch at number 10 this morning after her election triumph. Her first priority, to reshuffle her cabinet. Even so, her predecessor, Edward Heath, and others continued raising the spectre of the 1930s. Three years ago at the party conference, I warned my party that it would once again become known as the party of unemployment and that those with long memories would cast them back to the interwar years. But by 1983, to have that long a memory you'd have had to have been in your 50s at least. Remember how in Boys from the Black Stuff, Alan Bleasdale caught the frustration of sons sick of hearing about their parents' glorious protests in another time and age? Likewise, this jobless young Liverpudlian, interviewed on the eve of the People's March for Jobs, struggled to connect with the figures in the old newsreels. You see the marching out now, but it's not the same attitude. People are more relaxed this, you know, today than they were... No, and there's, you know, the Social Security's better, so you can get a bit better off than they were then. But you still think about it. But it doesn't seem the same in black and white, you know what I mean? And even in 1971, in that documentary about the Jarrow Crusade, there had been a striking hint of the desire among the young, even in Jarrow, to be free of other people's memories. Far from being proud of the Crusade, the younger generation is trying to live it down. They feel... It gives the town a bad image. Danny Finkelstein, something enormous happened around then, which is that something that was unthinkable, my economics master had said it at one million, became not only thinkable at three million, but was rewarded by a huge election victory. Was that as a result of a generational change? Absolutely. That, that Robert Carr clip was very interesting because Harold Macmillan shared the same position. When he became a peer, he called himself the Earl of Stockton in association with uh, the people he'd known in the interwar years and with his experience in the First World War trenches. And it was for people like him and then for Ted Heath a direct choice would they U-turn if unemployment rose too much on their policy of trying to reduce inflation and not therefore have as much union involvement in national policy making? And it was politically impossible and also they thought emotionally and socially unthinkable. And it simply became thinkable, not just because of the generational change of people forgetting the 1930s, but also because of the replacement with that, with a new generational memory of strikes and inflation. And those, uh, because they were choices in tension with each other, ultimately the, the generational shift produces a change from one uh, set of dominant ideas to another. So it isn't just a matter of, let's say, as some Conservatives would have had at the time that Thatcher had, more personal courage than Heath. It was actually <coughs> because she simply thought different things were important based on her experience. Well, that was certainly a very important element. And she also thought more things that were people had thought were politically impossible were, in fact, politically possible. That very famous speech where she says, you turn if you want to, I'm not for turning, is basically saying, despite the fact that people say, I'm going to create unemployment, we still think that is the correct policy to see through. Ultimately, unemployment will fall, and it'll have been a price worth paying. That's a price they could simply not have paid, emotionally or politically, in an earlier generation. Andy Beckett, you wrote about the period. What do you think? 
I, I think what Danny says is broadly right, but I think we shouldn't forget that Margaret Thatcher did have recurring anxieties about the level of unemployment that she didn't voice publicly. And John Hoskins, who was probably her key intellectual in the early 80s, when I spoke to him, said that Thatcher was constantly saying to him, why are the numbers going in the wrong direction? I don't understand it. Why are they going in the wrong direction? And in the late 70s, where the Conservatives made great play of high unemployment under Labour with their famous Labour isn't working poster, Thatcher privately was very anxious about the use of that theme because she conceded privately that unemployment would go up when she was Prime Minister. So let's go to the uh, audience now. Bob Ballerini, you remember your father losing his business in the late 1930s. Tell us a bit about that. Well, I can't tell you much, but I know we lost our house. I was only six, but we lost our house. My mother and I finished up in a room... We lost everything, basically. He was quite a successful businessman. Then, in, in the 80s, uh, during the recession, you lost your own job. Now, oh, yeah, I was, I was redundant. I had a very good job with Next, wide-ranging all over the country, and we were made redundant. I was just wondering whether or not, given that your father had lost his job in the 30s, and you then lost your job in the 1980s, whether you'd ever connected the two? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. What I did connect it to was was the new management, which was coming on in many companies at that time, totally Ah. disregarding employees. I was a lucky one. Lots of people got treated very shabbily. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Alan Radford, who's sitting next to you, uh, you were in South Wales at the time. What do you remember about the unemployment of the period? In the 1930s, when I was very young, but I played a part, we had social cohesion. We shared our houses. We shared scavenging for food. The small businesses, like the fish and chip shops, helped us out. We survived as a community. But in the 70s, it was a completely different picture. You had social security. You didn't need self-help. The government would pour the money in. A bit like that Liverpool youngster said. Those of you who are in the 50-something group, hands up how many of you as young people in the 1980s, when you were going through that period of high unemployment, unemployment sort, reflected upon it as being something that might have (coughs) been like the 30s? Joss Bell. I have quite vivid memories of the unemployment situation in the 80s and very much feeling as if it was a decade of have and have not. I didn't refer it back to the 30s. However, folks in their 40s and 50s a year ago referred back to the Jarrow March, the march for the NHS, replicating that very journey. And, you know, I was pleased to be able to welcome them all in Trafalgar Square. We absolutely felt it in our hearts that we were paying honour, if you like, to those Jarrow marches, but for the NHS. Of the 50s plus group, about half put their hands up and half didn't put their hands up. Those of you who are in your 20s, uh, listening to that uh, young man unemployed in Liverpool, who said he didn't see very much link between his situation and that of the 30s, uh, what did you make of him? Anybody? Just the kind of idea of, well... Life had changed, it didn't really mean very much to him. Ryan Gray. Um, it reminded me quite a lot when I hear my grandparents talk of the 1980s and kind of Thatcher and the winter of discontent and kind of how I have no correlation with that. I don't really feel any empathy or emotion towards it in the same way they do. And I imagine it's very much like he was saying it's a different time. I don't really feel anything towards it, so I can really relate to what he was saying. The Depression had a fairly simple, clear colouring as it was played out in popular memory. It was a bad thing. Next, let's look at the huge public crisis that followed the Second World War. This was rather more complex than the Depression in its popularly remembered form, both positive and negative. So now let's think about the place of the war in British minds and how it's changed as people who've lived through it have died and how new generations respond to it who have grown up. This is how the original VE night was reported from Piccadilly Circus in central London. That cheer was for the Royal Air Force Lancaster with lights full of blaze as it swept over. And the crowd is is just milling about, having the time of their lives, celebrating this great VE night. As the sound of those cheers die away, we give you a single voice. The voice of a mother who speaks all that is in our hearts at the close of the great struggle in Europe. 
It's been right nice to see folk so happy here in Glasgow. And I'm sure nobody will grudge them a celebration after all these years of hard work and anxiety. But for many a mother in the British Isles, this night must hold sad memories as well as joy. Maybe more sadness than joy for some. But my other four boys joined up. And it's one of them, Roy, that I'm thinking of specially today. He was in his second year learning to be a doctor at the Glasgow University in 1939. He volunteered for the Black Watch and then got a commission in the HLI. Roy was killed in Italy. By 1995, the 50th anniversary, things were beginning to change in ways not all veterans were comfortable with. There's this great showbiz element of the celebrations, which really does, I don't know if it disturbs you, it actually disturbs me, because I think about people, and I think about the people in the cities of Coventry and <clears throat> Plymouth and so on, who were smashed out of their homes, a half a million homes went after all. Those are the people that I remember, and it was the ending of this appalling six years that had been going on, where you couldn't walk out in the street. I, I, I don't remember the White Cliffs of Dover, or, or We'll Meet Again, or any of that. It's people. And this was this year's party to remember. And before we go any further, we must say hello to the most important guests that are with us this evening. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, everyone here at Horse Guards, how about we give it up for the veterans? Uh, Bob Ballerini, you uh, lived during the war. Did you feel that you were actually, that those six years actually shaped the man you were, or were they just another six years in your life? I loved it. I was in a lovely part of the country, evacuated from London, made friends which are only dying off now, actually. To me, the war was an adventure. And this is something that people very rarely say. Alan, did the war fundamentally change you, or was it just a, a chapter? It was regular food. We had the starvation of the Depression, which was followed by the early years of the Labour Party, where we were starved again. But during the war, we had rations and we had food parcels from Canada. We lived well, and my father had a trade an important trade, so there was always money coming in. Already we're on reality rather than, if you like, the handed-down version of what the war was supposed to be uh, all about. Now, those of you who are in your 50s, you got this, like I did, at first remove. It was what your parents talked about or didn't talk about, what, if you like, was the deep background of their lives. Um, Did it affect... You, how you thought about things, any of you were, uh, any of you 50 pluses? Diane Allard. There is nothing that has affected my political thinking and my life, actually, than the Second World War. I am the daughter of uh, Polish Jewish refugees. My uh, grandfather was a hero of the French Resistance. During my childhood, my parents talked about the war almost weekly at the dinner table. Andrew Edwards, my parents never talked about the war, my grandparents never talked about the war, but what we did watch was All Our Yesterdays with Brian English, and we also watched The World at War, made by Jeremy Isaacs, and that really did help me understand exactly what had gone on in the Second World War. Let's go over to the uh, 20-year-olds. Has it had any very big effect on the way you think about things? Ross Payton, I thought war was a fundamentally bad thing, so we shouldn't engage in it. I then sort of read the essays of George Orwell at the time of World War II. In that, he talked about how pacifism is objectively pro-fascist, in that if you hamper the war effort of one side, you automatically help out the other. And then that made me realise, sort of in the Iraq context, when I had actually been sort of quite sympathetic to the anti-war movement, that... I put forward alternative arguments in terms of that Saddam Hussein needed to be removed, but perhaps not in the way that the governments thought he did. So your perception of the Second World War had a feedback into what you thought about more current events. Danny? 
Yes, well, I think a lot about the fact that um, most of my politics and political attitudes are shaped by the fact that both my parents are refugees and that my mother was in Belson concentration camp. She'd been a friend of the Frank and Frank family and saw Anne Frank arrive in Belson. She's got a huge amount of uh, memory and understanding of what had happened to her in her life. That has been an important part of my politics. And, of course... uh, She's in her 80s now, uh, and the generations of people that, that my family have known, you know, almost everybody that we knew had some experience of that kind, and now a lot of those people are no longer here. And how we will understand or reflect upon issues of war and peace uh, will be very much affected by that. I'm sure that debates on Iraq, on Israel, on um, intervention in Syria are all informed by a generational shift away from the experience of the Holocaust and by uh, people's experience of Munich and the Munich Agreement fading. Let's look at one specific aspect of this. Dennis Healy, the Labour politician, led beach landings in Italy and Edward Heath once had to oversee the execution of a Polish soldier in the British Army convicted of rape. I didn't sleep particularly well that night. The Polish uh, man was taken outside by the guards and uh, tied up blindfolded. And then uh, the firing squad marched out, and I gave the orders for them to fire. Unfortunately, everything went wrong, and the commanders didn't reach the beach till after we did, and the uh, German army was immediately above the beach, uh, throwing uh, mortar bombs at us the whole time, but it didn't last very long, only a couple of days, and then the Germans moved on. The MP, David Davis, saw more recent evidence for the effect of war itself on politicians. It's the seat I represent was previously represented before me by the last two double decorated members of the House of Commons, each with their military crosses and their DSOs. And they were of a generation in which it wasn't just 20, 30, 40, it was nearly everybody uh, in the House, one way or another, had served or been impacted in a big way by the war. It's still true that there are some 50 or so people with either regular or territorial military experience And that does influence them. I mean, they are perhaps the opposite of what you'd think. They are very conscious of the vicious effects of war. They know war is industrialised murder. And it affects the way they vote. If you look at the Syria vote, the biggest single vote in the House of Commons, the last parliament, a very large number of them voted to uh, stop us getting involved in the Syrian war or abstained. Have you noticed that? Absolutely. I think something that's changed in Britain since the Falklands War, really, is that we go to war, with the exception of Syria, much more easily now. Very few MPs will vote against the war if there is even a vote in the House of Commons. And I think that's because so few MPs have experienced war themselves. Very few of them have served in the army and so on, whereas the MPs of the 50s and 60s would have done national service. They would have served in the war. They knew the kind of brutality and the sort of incompetence of military life as well as the, the more positive things, whereas now soldiers are terribly remote from us and the people that vote to go to war. Danny? I think there's a different thing, which is the fading of the idea of Munich as the primary analogy. If you look in America, people use <laughs> Vietnam for a long time as the primary political analogy. Don't let's get involved in another Vietnam. In Britain it was, don't let's forget Munich. And I think the fading of the idea of Munich, its possible replacement with the metaphor of Iraq, has been a very big change. So I actually don't quite share Andy's view about how memory has worked in this case. I think that uh, actually uh, we've seen a shift away from the idea that we can't appease dictators, which was the only reason for fighting the Falklands War. There wasn't a land reason or an economic reason. There was uh, The reason is that strong governments cannot appease dictators and allow them to take territory. Look what happened in Munich. And because that is now no longer such a strong metaphor and will possibly be replaced by Iraq, the Syria vote happened... And it took everyone by surprise that suddenly Britain, always the Atlanticist, clear partner of America, always doing the facing down of dictators, suddenly decided actually it was much more complicated than we thought. It isn't all Munich. It isn't facing down of pieces. I agree with some of that, but I think that the metaphor of Britain's current enemy as Hitler is still quite a strong one. I mean, it takes about a day 
for the tabloid cartoonist to mock up someone as the new Hitler when we're about to go to war with them. So I, I think Danny's absolutely right that Munich and what went around it has receded. But the idea that whoever we're currently fighting is the new Hitler, I think has got, you know, for good or ill, quite a few years in it yet. Uh, George Bamber. Um, I'm not quite sure I'd agree with the panel's views on this, actually. I think you, what you see now is a British public, which is quite shy of going into war. Uh, you've got Syria, you've got ISIS, and you've got Jeremy Corbyn as well, who's a Labour leader who seems, you know, very, very anti-war. And I think you can always see this in people's conceptions of the past as well. You see that the First World War uh, commemorations recently, the number of flowers around um, the, the Tower of London, for example. And I think this really chimes with people, the number of people that actually died in wars, and the human loss as well. Uh, Graham Spencer, I think the reticence about going to war is about the competence of the outcome. People have seen the outcome of Iraq and they've seen the outcome of Libya intervention, they've seen chaos and they think the industrialised killing is just not worth it, nothing can be gained. Sarah Perrin. I do think there's a, a general reluctance to go to war but I think perhaps there's a, an underestimation of the danger posed by ISIS or IS or whatever they call themselves who are to me are a, a fascist organisation. I think there are many apologists for IS. Would you characterise this as a, as a forgetting of the lessons for about for, Nazi uh, Germany? The, the forgetting of the lessons of the memory of fascism in the, in the 30s and World War II and why it was fought. Yeah. Uh, Victoria Jatundi. I'm only young, I'm only 20, but in GCSE and A-level I took history. In terms of ISIS, we are forgetting that, in a sense, it's the same thing as World War II. OK, let's move on a decade or two. The next broad phase in our history is one that anyone in their mid-30s or over will remember, the Cold War. When you hear the attack warning, you and your family must take cover at once. Do not stay out of doors. If you are caught in the open, lie down. For those of you who don't know, that is actually advice on what to do in the event of a nuclear attack. Um, <laughs> Juliet, that is, if you take it seriously, absolutely terrifying. How did the Cold War play in people's minds at the time? I think, I mean, there was always the idea that the shadow of the bomb and, you know, Punch had a cartoon, maybe we should cancel Christmas this year because we won't be here, sort of thing. But in fact, I think it was the Cuba cri missile crisis which really crystallised the public's view and understanding of the Cold War. In the early 80s, I remember I was living in Germany, my dad was in the army, we lived very near the border with East Germany. And I remember, as a sort of 11-year-old who probably was a bit too interested in tanks and things, being absolutely terrified every time they tested the siren at the barracks down the road from where we lived. And I thought, maybe this is it, they're coming over the border. Let me come to the 50-somethings and find out from you how big you felt at the time that the possibility of another terrible war or the division of the world in that way loomed in your lives. Jonathan Morris, I'm very, very aware of it. I, I think it's very conscious of the nuclear threat very conscious, of, I can't remember exactly when, USSR invading countries in Eastern Europe. We used to holiday in Europe every summer. Very aware of, of that constantly, actually. And yet it wasn't necessarily talked about in the schoolyard or socially. It wasn't openly talked about, but it was very much in my mind. Trevor McCrell. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Everybody was, um, I think, had it in the back of their mind that this could happen at any time. But you didn't really talk about it seriously. You joked about it. Karl Hohenstaufen. I think the Cold War, and especially because I lived in Latin America at the time, was the excuse to commit some of the worst atrocities ever seen across Latin America. Today, millions of British voters are too young to remember the Cold War. Might this be a factor in attitudes to nuclear weapons? No fear of being nuked by the Russians, so do the younger generation feel freer to say, what use are these things? Yes, Karina. I definitely, after reading about the Cold War, could not understand why nuclear weapons still existed. I mean, after learning about it, I, I thought perhaps that they no longer existed after, after that period of time. It's only seeing as time went on and seeing on the news and that kind of thing and realising, coming to the horror, that these weapons still actually exist. So it still has an effect on me. Do you think that your attitude towards, let's say, Trident is different from your parents' generation? I think I'm so apathetic towards nuclear weapons in a sense. If they go, they go, but if they stay, they stay. So, 
When communism suddenly collapsed in 1989, the generation who have, over the last decade, come to dominate British politics were at university or beginning their careers. Twenty years on, Radio 4 asked them how the fall of the Berlin Wall had shaped them. For Angus McNeil of the SNP, born in 1970, it meant hope. For George Osborne, born in 1971 and then at Oxford, it meant victory. I'm standing at the Berlin Wall at the spot where the breach has been made to open this new crossing point at Potsdamer Platz. The late 80s period is really the high point of the Thatcher government and conservative leads in the opinion polls and, and the sort of setting of ideas. And it's also the moment when those ideas go international. I mean, they weren't just British ideas, but you have them felt on the other side of the Iron Curtain and you know, that is the build-up to the great event of my teenage years, which was the fall of the Berlin Wall. The first 19 years of my life, things seemed to be quite rigid. It seemed that nothing would change. I think the Berlin Wall showed just exactly that change can happen and what happens when this change does occur and something that you felt was very permanent can actually be transformed almost overnight. In a way, for somebody like me coming from my uh, political perspective, it was a very hopeful thing. For David Miliband, now gone from politics, but in 2009 one of our youngest ever foreign secretaries, 1989 promised liberation from the dead weight of the past. I think that it did liberate progressive politics. It allowed the flowering of the social democratic tradition, the radical liberal tradition, untainted with uh, the... Uh, communist model. The, the red menace, the threat that we were in bed with the communists had been used against the Labour Party right back to the Zinoviev letter in 1924. And of course during the height of the Cold War that was a menace that was uh, branded us. Even in my memory in the 80s I have this memory that it was used as a, a threat, don't vote Labour because actually they're getting in bed with the Russians. For some of the older generations of politicians who'd reached middle age in the Cold War, its sudden end brought not youthful joy, but concern, as Ken Livingstone pointed out. An awful lot of Labour MPs, not in any sense necessarily on the left of the party, who'd gone off on all these, you know, paid-for visits to East Germany and Romania and come back saying, oh, they're workers' paradises, you know, there's so much we can learn. And it always struck me, this is the most, it's an insult to anyone's intelligence when these were clearly police states imposed from above. And they disfigured any concept of socialism. Oh, I think it was a great day for freedom. I watched the scenes on television last night and again... Mrs Thatcher had no so such doubts, not, not or at least not at first. David Willits, 30 years her junior, was then at the Centre for Policy Studies think tank. He remembered how the prospect of German reunification that rapidly followed the liberation of East Germany soon stirred old worries. The last proper meeting that we had with Margaret Thatcher before she lost office in 1990, when she had a group of us from the CPS to lunch with her, turned into a great big argument about Germany. Because Margaret Thatcher was very afraid that a united Germany would dominate Europe. There's no doubt that this coming together of the two parts of Germany is going to happen. But it's understandable that for some, Bitter memories of the past should colour their view of the present and the future. And she was arguing that you needed... That of course it was great that East Germany had democracy, but then there should be a long, slow process in which a democratic East Germany became an independent state and might slowly establish a friendly relationship with West Germany. And two of us argued that, no, the first thing that a democratic East Germany would do would be vote for unification with the West. To David Miliband, in 2009 at least, his generation seemed to have come of political age at an unusually positive moment. I think that in many ways my generation was a lucky generation. The generation of politicians in the 1960s had served and seen the horrors of war. The thatcher Kinnock generation had seen the chronic deindustrialization and depression of Britain of the 1970s. My generation, I think, our formative political influences were of strife in the 1980s, of the miners' strike, etc., but they were also, in the end, framed by the end of that short 20th century. Uh, we had, as the culmination of our political upbringing, essentially uh, liberation of people. And I think that's given us a, a sense of the opportunity that's in politics. 
So, we have generations in politics marked by quite different experiences. What did such experiences make unthinkable, and what is their forgetting made thinkable once more? Danny? After Yalta, my father realised he could never go home again. He'd lived in Lvov, which is now in the Ukraine, was when he was born in Poland. He'd been imprisoned in Siberia, and then he realised that this was going to be in Soviet territory and he was never going to be able to go home again. So during my entire youth and young adulthood, the question of the Cold War was not simply a theoretical one. And the falling of the Berlin Wall was not also a symbolic event only. It also meant the ability to open up the places where my parents had lived their lives and therefore had a very strong meaning for me. And it's interesting to me that coming only just that little bit ahead of the generation of David Miliband and George Osborne, that my attitude is much more conditioned by that battle over the Cold War than they are, uh, that they're conditioned by that kind of hope that took place after the Berlin Wall fell, and I suppose I've got a more cautious and pessimistic attitude. And is this exacerbated a bit by what has become the sort of extraordinary young age of politicians? I think that makes a huge difference. In in post-war Britain in the 60s and 70s, the people running the country were generally in their 60s, so they had a huge span of lived experience and memory to draw on. Whereas now we're talking about people, absolutely, who've only got perhaps five or six years of memory as adults before they become a researcher and then soon afterwards an MP. So, yeah, they've got much less to draw on in that way. Finally, let's think about what some at least have argued is a case of the power of political forgetting that is happening right now, albeit not quite on the scale of the Second World War, the Labour leadership election. There have been many articles over the summer by people who went through Labour's internal battles between left and right in the 1980s. Danny, what's your interpretation of what's going on in terms of political forgetting? A strong argument that's been used in the Labour leadership election is let's not go back to the 1980s. It doesn't appreciate that people cannot remember in large parts of the electorate what happened in the 1980s. I remember in the Conservative election campaign that I was involved in in 1997, they were just about to roll out again the winter of discontent when everyone realised that lots and lots of people couldn't remember it, it didn't mean anything to them and therefore it wouldn't have political potency. You can't run a campaign saying to people, this is going back to a period most of you can't remember. And absolutely critical to the failure of the argument made by the centre of the Labour Party against the left is that they've used a memory that people who they're opposing don't have. Andy Beckett, is that what you think you perceive? I think I read it slightly differently. I think for me a lot of the kind of unexpected strength of of Corbyn's challenge has come from people remembering more something more recent which is his role in the stop the war coalition um, against the Iraq war and also his position during the 90s and the noughties as the kind of conscience of the left against privatization and various things that new labor were doing and I think those associations for Corbyn from the 90s and the noughties are more potent and that's where a lot of his support is coming from. The issue in front of us is not whether we're pro or anti Jeremy Corbyn we may be one or the other it doesn't really matter the question is the one which we've just been discussing here which is whether or not your attitude towards that is formed by remembering something or choosing not to remember it or by something else Uh, nick man i remember growing up in the 80s i was at school during the thatcher years and it was a very difficult time for the have-nots the current slant of the Labour Party and the split in the Labour Party seems to be based on Corbyn's electability. Going back to the 80s was when Owen and Steele split from Michael Foote in the Labour Party to Foote because they felt he was too left and too union friendly and they were looking back at the 70s as a time of extreme in inverted commas union domination of the political table. What we're looking at now over the last decade actually is a Blair government which has moved exorbitantly to the right where we've got privatization and corporatization dominating the political table by a Labour government. So I think the political landscape of looking back as to what's happened is completely different. Uh, Ben Marshall uh, supporting Jeremy Corbyn but um, my mother worked on the checkouts and my dad worked at the docks in Dover and um, I feel it's because of Tony Blair's emphasis on education that I've become engaged in politics now and seeing The other three candidates, the beige paint, that's why I'm excited about Jeremy Corbyn. When you hear an argument that refers to history about this person that you like and that says, but look, we tried this in the 1980s, what does that make you feel? I question why I support Jeremy Corbyn and and I'm very interested to, to see 
how I feel in 20 years' time. But for now, I'm more of an idealist. I'd so, rather be an ideal 20-year-old than 20... So, in a sense, what you're saying is that being told, well, this didn't work in the 1980s, feels like an attempt to dampen down an ideal that you have, which you're reluctant to have happen. Well, yeah, who can say? Who can say what the future brings? OK, uh, who else feels strongly about this amongst the 20 group? Actually, nearly all of you, so... <laughs> Karina... Um, When I think of the 1980s, and I do think of some of Labour's setbacks in the 1980s, I do kind of, I'm on the fence about Jeremy Corbyn, but I do kind of see how he can fit into some of the stereotypes of the setbacks of some of the leaders in the 1980s Labour Party had, which makes me unsure about him. Well, let's try and move this towards some kind of a conclusion. Now, I'm bound to kind of put to the panel that an economic determinist would say, look... All this stuff about memory is all very well, but actually what motivates people is not what they remember and so on, it's what they calculate is going to happen to them if they take this decision or that decision. Danny? No, I don't agree. The hard data doesn't show it. In other words, people get a political opinion in their youth, they tend to stick to it, and so the hard data supports the thesis we've been discussing in the programme, but also the way that people's minds work supports it as well. People basically uh, assimilate facts through their narrative of the world, and their narrative of the world is informed by some of their youthful experiences. It's absolutely critical to my experience, my parents' experience, my experience of the 1980s. I was on the SDP National Committee. I cannot understand what the Labour Party is doing, but I then need to remember that I can't understand it precisely because of an experience that may shut me off from what's happening and make me misunderstand other people's opinions. Juliet. Yeah, I mean, I agree. You cannot make a decision which is free from memory or free from history or free from how you remember it, even if you don't do so necessarily consciously. I think we are formed from many influences. Part of them are current politics, but an awful lot of them are past events, past situations and attitudes that we've imbibed from memories. And going back, let's say, to 1979, the capacity of Thatcher to break clear from the orthodoxies that went before, or any other moment where actually people have felt it necessary to break clear from orthodoxy, do you think that sometimes memory acts effectively as a dead weight? Absolutely. Britain's an old country. There's a hell of a lot of memory for people to have, and it can just sit there making people think, this can't be done, we've tried it before, it's failed. That's applied to all kinds of things. And often the people that really make political difference in a country like Britain are the people who ignore what happened the last time around willfully and just get on with it and try something new. Andy Beckett, Juliet Gardner, Danny Finkelstein, thank you very much indeed.